from around the world they came. The quickest streetcars, bar none, and the ultimate test of man and machine. Five quarter mile race days and 800 miles of driving throughout Florida to decide a champion. In a world where people live to work, these rare heroes were in pursuit of something real, a raw adventure that would make memories for a lifetime. Friends, horsepower, and the open road. It's, uh, it's what everybody should do with their cars. These things aren't meant to sit in garages and uh, collect dust and make sure you don't hurt them. Drag and Drive is where you can get out and uh, you can beat on these things. You get to see everyone. You get to hear them run. And uh, you get to stop at gas stations with them. It's, it's literally a flashback to what they used to do. Drag and Drive is a series of racetracks that you travel to. Um, where you take this and you put it on the street after you race it at a track. You gotta make the car live and, you know, you gotta get the car to the next track while going fast. It's an addiction. Um, that's the easiest way to put it. Yeah, it's an addiction. <laughs> it's a huge gathering of friends and uh, we all have this mutual car addiction. Uh, travel from all over the country, we invade a track, and then for a week we drive from track to track, and we have some of the best times of our lives. Well, there's a lot of camaraderie between all these guys, and you know, racing with everybody for four or five days at these events is, it's uh, for the fucking adventure. This would be the hardest vacation they'd ever take. Welcome to Sick Week. I know we grew up a little too fast I miss the days that we trying to relax Where did the time go? It all passed Now I need to go back I had no worries but always had plans Only thing I did was take out the trash Now it's much harder to laugh Hard to get up and not work on my craft yeah. I need inspiration Don't need no validation No more medication Just try some meditating I don't need you to save me Feel like all of you hate me Everything's been so hard with all the situations lately I just need to numb the I just want to run away or vacation. I don't know what else to say now. I just need to know the The sport of drag and drive is taking the world by storm. First conceived in the mind of Hot Rod Magazine editor David Freiberger, the idea was to create the ultimate proving ground to decide who had the quickest streetcar in the world. Racers travel hundreds of miles throughout a week of racing, using the very same vehicle they compete in to drive down public roads. Events such as Drag Week, Rocky Mountain Race Week, and the Midwest Drags have captured the imagination of gearheads around America. And then came Sick Week. 
we sat down, we talked about it and said, okay, let's put all this stuff together and let's create Sick Week. So, well, we first were looking for a name and we're like, well, it's just obvious, let's call it Sick Week. But the idea is that we make the enjoyment the drive. So like me being one of the faster guys and a lot of people like me, a lot of times we're stuck like at the track longer, uh, the drive takes us longer, everything takes us longer. We get to the hotels, we miss out on a lot of the hotel stuff that goes on as well as the checkpoints because we're getting there dark and we're getting there later and it's like hey you know what you can prove a drag and drive car and if it can make it 100 miles it can make it 300 miles now you're just torturing the driver so the idea was let's make the journey as good as the destination before the journey could begin racers first had to pass an inspection with their vehicles as well as checks for standard drag racing equipment like roll cages and parachutes the machines must also have working street features such as lights, mirrors, and even a horn. Once the drivers completed their checks, Bradenton Motorsports Park was open for testing, and this is where the first quarter-mile runs of the week could take place. For some over the course of this week, there would be triumph. For others, there would be calamity. Drag and Drive is not solely about speed, but engineering a vehicle that can withstand the intensity of the drag strip, along with the endurance and tenacity needed to survive on the road. It didn't blow up yet, and we didn't wreck it. So we don't plan on doing either one. We don't plan on doing either one, but it's going good. The car, it's not rattling the tires, it's not spinning. It's just hitting boost cut right now. So we got a different map sensor, a bigger map sensor, and hopefully we can get up and get another test in it. Go real fast. As testing concluded on the track, racers moved next door to the Freedom Factory for the TBM Brakes pre-party. So we're having a uh, pre-party before tomorrow's events at the Freedom Factory. We are rolling the Malibu in. Hundreds of the world's quickest streetcars line the oval, bringing fans and sick weekers together in a celebration of speed and raw horsepower. For now, the mood was relaxed, but this was the eve of Sick Week, the event where finishing is a privilege and trophies awaited for just a fortunate few. A drag and drive event is made up of hundreds of miles, but racers must begin with just a quarter of one. The sun was out at Bradenton Motorsports Park as America's quickest streetcars prepared for the mayhem that awaited them over the next five days. Racers were briefed on the procedures for the week and came together to support one of their own before returning to the pits to prepare for launch. The goal of Drag and Drive is to record the quickest average time over multiple days of competition. Just one good day won't do, but you have to start somewhere. The fastest cars were given the first opportunity on the drag strip. With cool conditions, perfect track prep, and Florida's dry winter air, the conditions were ideal for record times.
take long for the racers of Sick Week to find their limits. As Stefan Rossi went for a wild ride in his Chevy Nova. Rossi managed to save the car, although the concrete barriers made their lasting impression. Felt amazing. Um, shifted second. Uh, I think I shifted second. I actually can't remember. And then I just saw fluid under the cowl on the windshield, and then it just got slippy. And uh, I killed the power, pulled the shoe, tried to correct it. And yeah, the rest is <laughs> nightmare. <laughs> Amazingly, the team went to work to prepare the car for street driving and take on the rest of Sick Week. These guys weren't finished yet. Dave Schroeder, a two-time champion of Hot Rod Magazine Drag Week, arrived at Sick Week with high expectations. The Canadian racer and his co-pilot John Enns had completed weeks of testing in Florida where their nitrous-breathing Corvette was getting quicker and quicker with every pass. Unfortunately, day one of Sick Week saw Schroeder's chances burn out when his motor melted two pistons. So we, uh, I think we, uh, well, we took out uh, pistons one and three. One really bad, uh, just past the eighth mile. I think our rings weren't sealing, and I think we got a little bit of oil uh, squeaking by, and we, I think we uh, dead out those two cylinders. And uh, yeah, I think it's, you know, we've, yeah, it's Monday. It's uh, to do a half-ass repair right now. Uh, isn't in the cards. Shorter wasn't the only leading contender to have his sick week campaign derailed early. After running a class leading 6.26 second pass, Tom Bailey was forced to withdraw when he discovered his engine had dropped a valve. In the harsh world of drag and drive, failure for some means opportunity for others. Sweden's Stefan Gustafsson and Michigander Steve Morris were suddenly thrust into contention for the outright win. Gustafsson began the week in strong style with his quickest ever run, a 664 at 214 miles an hour. With the assistance of Drag Week veteran Eric Yost as his co-pilot, Gustafsson was ready for the week-long fight. Morris had a mere handful of runs on his brand new Boostmaster wagon, but showed out with a 682 at 215 miles an hour, noting that he had plenty of power left in reserve in the nose of his massive wagon. We can go faster, I think. I think you know. I mean, that was that's gonna be my base base pass. I mean, that's just it. And uh, so we'll start sneaking up on it, you know, and try and go faster. The modified class was set to be a battle royale between Michigan's Michael Borgren and Florida's Rick Prospero. Borgren's insane Volvo wagon drew first blood with a 685 at 203 miles an hour, earning cheers from the Bradenton crowd. Prospero had the local knowledge and multiple drag week wins under his belt. He handed in a 686 from his Mazda RX-7 to be right behind Borgren on day one. For many of the sick weekers, Bradenton would provide a day to remember. The perfect winter weather made for quick times and lots of horsepower, but for some, there would only be heartbreak. Um, it actually, the gate stuck shut, so it made 80 pounds of boost in the burnout box. So, it was just a little more than the stock block could handle. We have another engine, we just kind of don't have enough time and we don't have, that motor's not exact to this, so there's certain parts that we just don't have for it just don't have enough time to get those and make it all happen. So we'll regroup and try next time. Uh, the other one right here, blew the back out of it. As soon as we went fire back up and the ignition hit, it uh, backfired the nitrous that had accumulated in the crankcase through a melted hole in the piston and uh, just blew the valve covers off, blew the uh, oil pan down, and uh, uh, just any weak link that it found uh, detonated. In this strange moment, Brian McKee's steering wheel came off in his hands. The chicken fried Falcon was scratched up, but the only injury for Brian was to his ego. There was a nasty accident toward the end of the day when Jasmine Robertson's Cadillac turned hard left at the finish line. Jasmine was taken to the hospital for observation and was later found to have a fractured arm, but fortunately was able to escape serious injury in this very scary crash. 
As many stories as could be found on the track, the true soul of Dragon Drive lives on the road. After handing in the results to officials, it was time for the racers to make the transition to the street. Sick Week is, after all, a test of streetcars. And once you hit the road, you find freedom. The first day's drive consisted of a 158-mile trip from Bradenton to Orlando. It didn't take long for the streets of the Sunshine State to start challenging Sick Week competitors. We uh, got 9.6 miles out of the thing here and uh, pouring oil out of the bottom. So we, we fixed what we thought we fixed, an oil leak at the track, but we didn't fix it. So we're out here with the whole oil pump and everything off trying to figure out where it's leaking from. Uh, we ended up uh, having uh, rocker stands on our jessels were just interfering with the push rods a little bit. And uh, they wore them. They wore in enough that we got excess valve lash. <coughs> lost, lost uh, the, the lash got really loose and started hammering the push rod, balled the push rod, took out the cup on the uh, rocker arm as well. So we went through, pulled all the exhaust rockers off, filed them with a file, got our clearance, and we're now putting it back together so we can hit the road. Yeah, so we had, um, there's the light clunking sound we heard, and then went to slow down and use the brakes and it got a lot worse. Um, so we just coasted in here pretty much. And um, this caliper, the two bolts on it, one of the things we checked, but we thought we checked, but I guess we didn't. They were loose and fell out. The calipers just basically just hanging in here. Hurt the wheel a little bit, hurt the caliper a little bit, but we'll get some new bolts and go down the road, so. Even some of the leading contenders were making adjustments as they went, cajoling engines designed for high horsepower into making it long distances. It's not keeping up and I had a fan shut off. Just not enough air, even over, over that radiator, so just doing a little propping up and getting more air over the, the radiator. Yeah, just so there, cut it down up. Yeah, we had to cut that oh, much no. off the belt to make it work. They're, they're down. <laughs> John, what do you think? I think they let them fill the lanes for a little longer, and then they have the rest. So. Oh, there it is. Yeah, that's what I was saying. They popped the cap off, and the coil's on the inside of the car. So when the cap came off and spun upside down, it rotated, winding the coil wire. And uh, inside the car, all we saw was the coil spinning. like guys kind of shit, so it was pretty crazy. The first checkpoint of Sick Week was the Avon Park Depot Museum. The drivers were required to take a photo of their car with the California Zephyr rail carriage in the background. Then they could get back on the road. The checkpoints let competitors regroup, as well as giving fans the opportunity to see the vehicles up close. Staying right around 190. He's doing really good. As night fell, plenty of teams were still making the drive, doing whatever it took to make it to Orlando. We lost the radiator fan, so as in melted it. So we put a new one on, wired it correctly the second time around, and now we're gonna go drive to open them. The second and final checkpoint for day one was Old Town USA, which is a popular cruise-in venue for Florida hot rodders. The bright lights represented safe harbor and the ability to take a deep breath for drivers who had been on the road for many hours. There were some 300 drivers who remained in competition by the close of day one, and if they were lucky, they could drive to their hotels and find relief. But for some, sleep would have to come later. Much, much later. I put a new water pump on it, and it's not working out too good. It's leaking. So I bought the old one. Uh, mechanical I'm gonna put that back on it's never let me down so we're going back to that but this is what I get for modifying something over the winter and not be able to road test at home because it's snowing and nasty out every week so the first leg of the adventure was at an end but there were many many more miles yet to drive and many many more stories yet to come from sick week Day two donned to cold and wet conditions, as well as the news that racing would have to be canceled. 
Drivers were first required to make a stop at Orlando Speed World where they could take photos and receive their directions to begin the drive to Gainesville. Overall leader Stefan Gustafson wanted to get an early start to his drive, but after dumping oil all over the hotel parking lot, he would need to take some time to make repairs. It was uh, going really early this morning. I wake up uh, here at like a half past uh, four. And we was going to hit the road at four to miss out the rain. But when we fired up, it was uh, oil everywhere. And uh, the, the gasket on the oil filter was uh, broke. It was shut out. So we changed the filter and we just shut it out again. So we had to pull the pan and uh, take out the relief valve in the oil pump. And, uh, grind it off a little bit so it wouldn't stick. So that was like five hours <laughs> for this small things. But uh, now we're on the road again, so we're going to hit up to Gainesville. Let me go, there's no doubt. Gotta get out of this small town. You took my heart from me. Now you're everywhere I see. You took my heart, it's already broken You don't have to wait I can take the pain I will surrender, let me go On a new adventure After driving through Daytona, the first checkpoint was the Michael Crotty Bicentennial Park, complete with stunning views of the Atlantic Ocean. Swimming might have been out of the cards on this day, but the relaxed environment still gave people many ways to smile. On the new adventure. When the weather closed in, the roads were challenging enough for most and downright perilous for some. But a brave few of the sick weekers would take it one step further. Following their vacation on the beach, the sick week convoy turned inland, and with that turn, they headed for the small town of Palatka. the wintry tinged weather of Florida during this week might not have been the ideal time for ice cream, some people on the road trip needed to stop and have that frozen treat. Returning to the drive was Tom Bailey, albeit in his LS swap Volvo, rather than the five second street legal pro mod he would have preferred to have been in. Yesterday we were, um, left the track, we were just about to the first checkpoint, we ended up being about 70 miles and uh, everything was cruising along fine. 2,000 RPM, 60 miles an hour, and then next thing you know, it sounded like people poured, somebody poured gravel in the intake. Uh, ended up dropping an exhaust valve. Actually, the, the valve broke, so it has to, I mean, I believe, I won't name any names, but it seems like a manufacturing defect because the stem and everything's all tied up exactly the way it's supposed to be. Spring's not broke. All that stuff's good, but the valve is wedged sideways in the piston. So. Um, so no clue, we didn't have a spare head. We got valves, springs, uh, pistons, rods, like all of that, but just didn't have the, the part to fix that. So ended up pulling it back. Uh, we got a ride back, 
got the rig, went and picked up the car, took it back to the track, and then uh, we got in the Volverino, which was sitting at the Freedom Factory, and so then we got in the hotel 2.30 this morning and long for the ride or whatever for the week and see how everybody does. There's a lot of lots of cool cars, lots of fast cars, I mean, so. Just one last leg remains for day two, and with most of the teams able to arrive in Gainesville before sunset, there was an opportunity to party. Modified competitor Kevin Smith threw open the doors of his race shop, which allowed sick wee competitors to tend to their vehicle's wounds or simply add to them. Gainesville Raceway was hidden under a veil of fog as day three of sick week dawned, with cool conditions delaying the start of competition on the racetrack. The track temperature was simply too cold for the fastest cars, so the day began with racers from the Dial Your Own category making the first runs. Dial Your Own was a new concept for sick week, encouraging racers to focus on consistency. The aim was to have the smallest possible spread between all their times and with over 100 competitors contesting the class, competition was ridiculously tight. All right, so normally we start off with some fast cars today, but seeing how it's so cold, the track is cold, so we're trying to run some key cars. Uh, you, you pick a time or you run a time, and then you want to run the most consistent runs you can of that first time you ran. Um, so we actually ran a 11.30 our first day. We're going to try to get close to 11.30 today. The 850 street race classes were also beginning to heat up as drivers tried to put their opponents into a spin. On the first day of the week, none were more perfect than RC Flint's Honda S2000, which scored a dead-on 850 with a zero run in street race 275. He was looking to keep that pressure on his opponents all week long. We hit the road, um, had a good drive, and then obviously yesterday everything kind of rained out, so that was unfortunate, but it did keep us in first place for one day longer, so uh, that's kind of looking at the bright side, but yeah, um, super happy with the car. It's been, it's been really good. I'm glad because we, we just got it together on Monday uh, before um, sick week, and then on Saturday at Streetcar Takeover, which was like a day before um, sick week, we broke the rear end, so we had to scramble to get the car um, fixed. Um, so we did that. So yeah, overall, I'm really happy with it. Um, I love this car. The news was not as good for Rick Steinke in the 235 Outlaw Street Race class. He was running equal first coming into Gainesville, but was juggling too many problems to continue in his iconic honk if parts fall off 1967 Chevelle. So uh, we had a pretty rough day on the road yesterday, going from Orlando through the checkpoints, uh, really bad oil leak that we managed to fix, and then we started burning up rocker arm bearings. Um, I just rebuilt all the rockets before coming here, so it must be a defective bearing set. Um, and then we lost reverse and the trans brake, so I can't back up. Uh, we spent the night at the hotel pulling part of the trans apart and trying to fix it. Electrically, everything's all right, but there's something internal wrong with the transmission. Overall leader Stefan Gustafson struggled to put down a six second pass on a track that was giving him tire shake on every single attempt. With one last opportunity, very shortly before sunset, Gustafson came through with a 683 at 218 miles an hour to maintain his lead. Modified's Rick Prospero put his confidence and all of his knowledge about Florida State racetracks into a few runs as he sought to take over the number one position. Hopefully, uh, hopefully today, I don't know, the track, we, we run at this track, so we're familiar with it. And uh, from our experience running uh, small tire eighth mile stuff, we usually slow down by about two tenths. 
So we're going to try to put a soft A to B in it and hopefully go maybe a 7 flat. We'll see what happens. Just like Bradenton, racers were going to the edge and sometimes over. Andrew DePita made the save of the week. He kept his Mustang from hitting the walls after performing a big wheel stamp. Not so fortunate was Carl Stancil, who lost control of his blazer when fluid got under the tires. Stancil was fine, but he was highly frustrated that his sick week was over. For those who did make it through the day, it was time to get on the road to Georgia through small town Florida. This was the shortest drive of the week, but with two days of racing and 400 road miles already racked up, the list of casualties was growing fast. We burned up a real main seal. I don't know where it went, I'll show it to you. But yeah, we about a half mile back, just started smoking like crazy. and. Got it out, diagnosed it, but uh, trying to find one was a challenge right now, so. After driving through Alachua and High Springs, teams found themselves in Brantford, next to the historic Suwannee River. There was no time for swimming on this day, just a quick drive across the border and into Georgia for the final stop of this particular trip. Along the route, fans gave their encouragement, helping teams through the final stages of their drive. One more day down and a cold night settled in, racers were officially at the halfway point. It's a day of cautious celebration for some, but as we all know, sick weeks trials were very much far from over for everyone. I'm on the way tell them I don't play. Yeah, I'm on the move trying to get my pay. Yeah. I might just move on and watch and pray. Yeah, I'm on the way. I'm on my way. Yeah. Manifest this year, seven plus on the ropes. They ain't doing this shit, sipping over my flows. South Georgia Motorsports Park has played host to many record-setting runs across its storied history. And sick weekers were looking forward to taking advantage of the mineshaft air and legendary traction at this drag strip. Stefan Gustafson was one and done at South Georgia. He rocketed to a 668 at 219 miles an hour. That speed, the fastest at sick week. We did uh, so many mistakes yesterday, so it was really good to have one pass again. Do it with one, one and done that Eric says we're going to do all week. But it's harder than you think to do that. So, yeah, we're happy. 668, and uh, we have put a much softer tune in. We did that Raiden Ton. So, hopefully, if we can put that spicy tune back in and Raiden Ton, and we have figured all, out all the other things, it will be faster there. Steve Morris needed to get his wagon deep into the mid sixes to keep pace with Gustafson. Unfortunately for Steve, he burned up a transmission after his opponent had difficulty staging. He and son Kyle were faced with having to rebuild the transmission right there in the pits of the drag strip. So basically, we got screwed out of our first pass today, so we had to go make a second pass, wait for other cars to go through. And uh, he went in the burnout box. He just zung right up to the moon. So 
we think we just burned up first gear, broke a sprag or something like that. So uh, we found all the parts pretty much here to rebuild everything. So we're gonna rebuild it right here in the parking lot. Nick Taylor realized his six second dreams and Uncle Sam keeping a lock on second place in Unlimited. That's Seventh right. pass on the car, 698. Did it feel fast? Because we put a lot down low. It felt 294, 450. So that's yeah. where it all was between the 330 and the, eight. and the 8. I could feel it because the front tire was like going like this. Like it didn't set the front tire down until Forever. a long time. That's why I was like, okay, it, it took what he gave it and it, it was good. Everybody's been on us all week about the G body shuffle. Like, you need to get that air roll bar fixed. No, but it's good. The car just is working the way it is. So. Michael Borgren closed the gap and modified with his 685 setting up a thrilling last day battle against Floridian Rick Prospero. James Doc McIntyre drove to one of the quickest naturally aspirated passes in drag and drive history. He laid down a stunning 788 out of his legendary Sea Red Camaro. Sea Red Run. Sea Red Run fast. It was a smooth day in South Georgia with few incidents on the track, as long as you could avoid what your opponents were literally throwing at you. Once the sick weekers were happy with their time slips, they were told to take whichever road they wanted to get to the Don Garlitz Museum of Drag Racing in Ocala, Florida. Most of the hardy teams chose the interstate, braving the chaos of traffic to reach Ocala as quickly as possible. earlier efforts, Doc McIntyre was brought back down to earth when a valve problem got the team's attention. They pulled off to the side of the road and did work at an abandoned gas station. Uh, heard a noise after our fuel stop and uh, I think we lost a valve spring. We've got springs. First we thought it might be a lifter, but it looks like it's a number eight uh, cylinder has a spring issue. So we've got springs and tools. We just didn't have enough tools. So we'll see if we can't get our patch together. And make it to range, and I don't know if we'll stop tonight at Ocala because unless we need more tools and I don't know what Garland's museum has if it's got a full shop we can stop in there. Just a few more miles down the road teams were filing into the Don Garland's museum putting on an impromptu car show at what was being called the greatest checkpoint in drag and drive history. Both Sick Weakers and Sick Waters had free access to the museum. They were able to enjoy a spectacular evening on this penultimate day of the event. All that sat ahead of them? A few more miles of interstate and a few more quarter mile runs at Bradenton Motorsports Park. That would be the difference between failure and success. World's hardest vacation was nearly at an end. The sick weekers were left with just one goal get to Bradenton Motorsports Park and make at least one run. A final stretch of interstate was all that was left to conquer before racing stretched into the evening. In a sport where so many efforts are measured in thousands of a second, success in drag and drive is registered in days. 
For some, finishing is the only goal and maybe the only one they should start with. For others, it's setting records and winning helmets, like the ones given out at the end of sick week for class champions. Racers reflected on what it meant to be near the end of the event. Yeah, we're back in Bradenton Friday. One more pass. One more pass. <laughs> and we have done it. I was telling him earlier, this is probably the most fun I've ever had in drag racing. Getting to come down here and race and be close to the beach and be with our friends, I couldn't ask for anything better. Well, I'm going to tell you, it's not as easy as I thought it was going to be. I thought I was prepared, and I think I was more prepared than a lot of people, but I still wasn't prepared for everything. Rick Prospero and Michael Borgren went down to the wire in Modified. A flying 684 set the target for Borgren, but try as the man might, his awesome Volvo just couldn't quite return to its Monday pace. A 691 would be the best that Borgren could muster, and the sick helmet would stay in Florida with Prospero. Speed came easy for some, but not so much for Shane Levistad. After a torrid week that included pulling the engine out of his car in the pits at Gainesville Raceway, Shane went on a wild ride into the wall after a front-end failure. He was fine, but his Honda CRX needed to be unceremoniously dragged away. Friday night under the lights turned into a heart stopper when Aiden Bailey turned over his 57 Chevy wagon at the finish line strike. It looked dramatic. But with a roll cage built by NHRA top fuel driver Richie Crampton, Aiden was well protected and walked away without a scratch. Stefan Gustafson arrived at Bradenton with a commanding lead for the overall win. One more six second run would seal the deal, and he did just that, running 683, putting his average out of reach of all the competitors in the field. But for good measure, Stefan wasn't done yet. He returned to the night session and left nothing on the table, roaring to a 653 at 217 miles an hour. It was the quickest run of the week at sick week, enough to take his average to 6.677 seconds and enough to lock him into the third quickest all-time average in the history of drag and drive events. And on that brilliant note of punctuation, the first sick week was at an end. There were records, of course, but most importantly, memories. A life on the road in hand-built machines engineered to take on all that come at them is a life well lived. And with the next generation of Drag and Drive competitors primed up, the future is in amazing hands. Drag and Drive is a sport ready for those who want adventure, who want to see the world, and who want to drive awesome hot rods. There's one question that remains. Do you have the sickness?